everyone and welcome. My name is Sally and on behalf of the Harvard Bookstore, I am so pleased to introduce this virtual event with Ellie Mistal, presenting his new book, Allow Me to Retort, A Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution. He will be joined in conversation by Joan Walsh. Thank you for joining us virtually this evening. Harvard Bookstore's virtual event series continues this winter, bringing authors and their works to our community and our digital community. Find our event schedule at harvard.com slash events, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and shop our shelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speaker at any time during the talk tonight, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. This event also has auto-generated closed captioning available. Depending on the version of Zoom you're using, you may need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. You can disable captions there as well. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase Allow Me to Retort on harvard.com. Your purchases truly make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you all for tuning in and purchasing books from Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you have no doubt experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And now I'm delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. Ellie Mistel is the Nation Magazine's legal analyst and justice correspondent, an Alfred Noble, Nobler Fellow at the Type Media Center, and a prominent constitutional law scholar. He is a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School and was the former executive editor of Above the Law. Joining him this evening is fellow The Nation correspondent Joan Walsh. She is also the co-producer of the Emmy-nominated Emmy documentary, The Sit-In. Harry Belafonte hosts The Tonight Show. They'll be discussing Ellie's newest book, Allow Me to Retort, A Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution. In this book, Ellie argues Republicans are wrong about the law almost all of the time. And now he explains why it with an in-depth look at the law as they claim to know. Allow Me to Retort is an easily digestible argument primer offered so that people can tell the Republicans in their own lives why they are wrong. Zerlina Maxwell, MSNBC analyst, calls this book essential reading for people who think that you need to go to law school to understand our founding documents. We're so pleased to be hosting this event tonight, and the digital podium is yours, Ellie and Joan. Uh, well, thank you so much. Um, you know, obviously, what I've got to start with, Ellie, is what was your LSAT score? <laughs> you know, because that's what we're asking now. We wait, we white people. And I haven't been asked that since like the last time I was at the Harvard bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, it's funny, Joan. Like the, you know, if, if, if the 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 idea that black people are not qualified enough to be where they are is a yeah. persistent one in certainly every profession and in, in, in every law school in the country, including uh, my law school at Harvard, right? So one of my, I think, interesting, I, I don't wanna call it mistakes, but one of my interesting choices in life is that, you know, I, I, got, I went to Harvard College and, and everything was great. I really liked college. I was good at college. Um, and then like so many people who are good at college, I didn't wanna have a real job so I thought, yeah. hey, maybe I should go to get a postgraduate degree. Um, I, you know, people said that I was good at arguing. So maybe I was, uh, maybe I should think about law school. I was certainly bad at math. Uh, <laughs> so it, so it wasn't going to be business school. You know, so you take the LSAT and, you know, you, you do pretty well. Uh, and, you know, so you apply to law schools. And I applied to the top, you know, five law schools at the time, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, uh, Columbia, and NYU. I'm not going to say which one was my safety school, but I was confident that I would get into one of those five based on my scores. And I got into four of the five. I didn't get into Stanford. I'm not. I also Stanford. I applied to 11 colleges. I got into 10. So I didn't get into Stanford. I applied to five law schools, got into four. And I might not Stanford material yeah. for some reason. For some um, reason. Lucky for you. I LSAT think. scores were kind of like mainline. This is like way back in the day. Um, uh, so this is like main, my LSAT score is kind of mainline Harvard. 
but a little bit low for Yale. Yale had a kind of slightly higher. So, you know, it was still kind of within the range for Yale, but it was a little bit low. And I was like, well, you know what? I don't want anybody to, to say that I'm affirmative action admit. Um, so, so I'm going to go to Harvard where my scores are completely, you know, uh, center mass as opposed to Yale, where maybe I got a little bit of help, right? Um, and so that was a big part of my decision making as an idiot 22 oh. year old, right? And so, of course, you know, two weeks into school, you get a guy who's just like, oh, so, so, so you got in because of affirmative action. And I say, no, I actually, blah, blah, blah. yeah, well, you know, I, my friend from wherever, he beat you by two points and he had to get in. So clearly you're affirmative action admin. And I'm like, oh my God, I actually can't win. Like there, there he, actually yeah. isn't. And that's the problem, right? Like there isn't a score that's good enough for white people to make them think that you belong. Like if you are one of those people who, who, who denigrates the accomplishments of black people, then there is no score that I can put up on the board that'll make people think that I belong to be there. Literally Harvard College could admit an entire class full of people who got a perfect score on, on their SATs. So even if you post a, a perfect score on your SAT, if you're black, some white person can say, well, you know, my, my buddy got a 1600 and they didn't get into Harvard. So clearly you're from Nevada. There's no way out. No, I know. I, and, you know, we, we don't know. No one ever asked Brett Kavanaugh. You know, he likes beer. We don't know his score. I mean, I don't, I don't want to belabor this, obviously. We have more to talk about. But it just was so not shocking to me. Nothing shocks me anymore, Ellie. Nothing shocks me. But it was so disgusting it's, that they it's so bald right it's like the and yes it's, it's like, and i feel like that's that's the that's one of the kind of ongoing uh, uh fractures from the trump era um the 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 people who are that kind of racist like the tucker carlson's of the world world uh there's no need to hide it anymore there right. is no dog whistle they've swallowed the dog whistle they've traded it in um for a bullhorn and and you know people and i remember when i was a kid people used to say uh, uh well you know i I prefer, you know, black people, you say to me, I, I prefer Southern style racism because, you know, you always know where you stay. You know, right out front. Your face, right. Where the Northern racism, you know, you never know where it's coming from. And man, I was always like, no, give me some Northern style racism. I don't need, <laughs> I don't need it but, up in my face every day. <laughs> but now we're all coming out with it. So and now it's know. all Southern style racism. It's all su Southern style. Um, so I love your book. And I wrote down, I mean, I underlined things and I wrote down things and, you know, it, it, it's so liberating to be told that this is a flawed document. Um, and it was written by a bunch of guys, some of them slavers, some of them who thought they wanted abolition, but really didn't care that much to kick those other guys out. Uh, and I just feel like you are telling people how flawed it is and they are not feeling it, or, or at least, you know, on when you go on TV. Probably yeah. here, people will feel it, I hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I kind of knew that was going to happen. I'm not like this. I'm not surprised by some of the reaction that I get online um, and in the media when I try to tell white people that this document is 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 not good it's it's it's, it's garbage it's not the best certainly um it desperately needs improvement right and so like but it's also like you get all the the classic counter arguments from people who just from my perspective just haven't thought it through exactly right so right. you get people who say like well you know it might be flawed but this was the best deal that they could make at the time um to get all the good things that that, that are embodied by america i was like best deal according to who Right. Because y'all didn't ask me. Y'all y'all certainly didn't ask anybody that looked like me, right? Like, because here's, here's what didn't happen. They didn't go to, to James Madison and say, hey, hey Jim, come over. Uh, what, what do you think about this declaration? And Jim said, well, well, Master James, I, I, I sure enough don't know. I, you know, now I don't like it when you, when you sell my children. That That's bad. But Can we but just, Master like, James, draw the line there? Right? But Master James, this, this King George, he needs to be stopped. And, and I, I just think that we can't have taxation without representation for you. That, that's what <laughs> I think, Master. Like, that's not what happened, all right? So, like, yeah. that deal that you think was so, like, that's not the deal. You couldn't have made me make a deal with slavers, right? 
Can nice. the main Frederick Douglass make a deal with slavers? So, so, so I, I, I reject out of hand this argument that like this was the best deal that could be made at the time. No, screw that, right? The second kind of classic counter argument you have is, well, you know, it can be amended and it actually has been amended. And so the right way to change the constitution is not to throw it out, it's to, it's to change it through the amendment process. And now we get to really why I wrote the book. Because if you look at the amendments, my book is particularly focused on the constitution. Yes. If you look at the amendments, what you see throughout history is the attempt by the conservative party, whoever, whatever they're calling themselves in the morning. Like, I don't care, like after the Civil War, the conservative party was Democrats and now right. they're Republicans and tomorrow they might be the Whigs. I don't care what they're calling themselves. The conservative party at every point has tried to limit the effectiveness of the amendments and limit the amendments scope and reach so that they do not reach Black people, minorities in general, women or other vulnerable people. That has been their entire project. This constitution was constructed to preserve white male hegemony in the new world. And at every point, the conservatives have tried to keep it that way. That's your amendment process. Right. Well, and I also loved the way you took apart amendments, even amendments that you like, you know, like the superhero First Amendment, you know, so fantastic, potentially protecting all our speech. But the way that the, our current Supreme Court and that, you know, that that's really what we have to talk about. You know, we've had bad Supreme Courts before, but this is really something that is going to consign us to a very bad future if they keep going on uh and the way that they didn't use free speech for the homophobes etc who didn't want to bake cakes and for gay people and deal with transgender people so explain what they found yeah, so part, part of what's happening that we have to understand that's happening in our country is that the conservative movement is ascendant. And because of their ascendancy, because they control the courts, not just the Supreme Court, but many of the lower courts as well, they're wackadoodle. And that's the best way of putting it. They're, that's the technical term. Their wackadoodle Absolutely. constitutional theories are ascendant right now. So, for instance, when you look at the gay rights case, they are making a religious freedom argument against gay rights, which is ridiculous. We live in a secular society. That means right. I don't care what Jesus told you to do. You take your Jesus and you can practice it in the privacy of your own home. You, you can practice it without state interference, but what you can't do is use your Jesus to deny somebody else their rights. That's just not what we do in a secular society, right? So when when you're talking about when you talk about like I, I I bring up Masterpiece Cake Shop. This is for those who don't know. This is the Masterpiece you know, the, Cake Shop, right? This is the baker. The 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 gay couple wants to buy a cake. The the baker said, No, God says you're icky, and I won't bake you a cake. It's important to remember that the 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 gay couple they were not asking the baker to jump out of the cake and say I love gay people. <laughs> it wasn't. They weren't trying to pay the baker in sexual favors. They were trying Not at all. to get the baker to engage in the, in, in the business that he went into business to provide, right? They were trying to get him to- Making a good cake. Legal tender for his cake because he ran a cake shop. That is right. not a religious argument. That is, that is a discriminatory argument. And all, all the court did was allow for that baker to be discriminatory. Now, you can imagine a better argument. You can imagine a free speech argument, right? Now, again, I don't think the baker has a speech interest, whatever, in his cake. But you can, you, I can imagine a speech argument when it comes to gay rights. For instance, I write columns. You can't force me to write a column about somebody I don't. I don't agree with. You can't first write a positive comment column about somebody I hate. That's against my First Amendment right as an artist, right? You can't force me to, right. so you, can, you know, if put, put it like this if the New York Times ever lets me write Donald Trump's obituary, mm, mm. we're, we're going <laughs> to talk about some First Amendment then, right? Because you can't force me to be nice about that, right? That's a speech argument, right? And I would respect 
speech arguments uh, uh, if you if we're talking about true speech acts. I do not think baking a cake is a speech act, but more to my point, the conservatives didn't even try to argue that baking a cake was a speech act. They went right for this cockamamie religious freedom of right. objection. Um, which is which is where we are, and it's just emblematic and indicative of how right where the, the the Supreme Court has shifted, not just over our lifetimes. I mean, like literally in the past fifteen or twenty years. Yeah. Um, and what we're up against right now. And you know, your chapter on the Second Amendment, everybody has to read. Uh, but while I, you know, I knew that you were explaining that there's really no right to self-defense. You, you guys are, are just making this up. Um, you come back around to the fact that the whole militia argument is actually coming out of uh, Southern slavers that wanted to have their militias and not have them taken away by the north or by or by the federal government because they were afraid of slave revolts right so this is where i get tagged as a critical race theorist which i'm not because critical race theorists like read like law review articles and stuff and they like spend time in libraries and stuff you don't do that and i know I, I play video games in my free time right so i'll see if cute kids <laughs> You have to understand how racism works in this country, right? And so for something like the Second Amendment, remember James Madison, who wrote the entire Bill of Rights against his will, James Madison basically is, people have to think of him um, like Aaron. Like he, he knows that it's wrong. He knows that the Bill of Rights um, ultimately is something that will be used against him. But like uh, uh, people forcing Aaron to make the golden calf, James Madison was forced to fashion the Bill of Rights, knowing full well that it was the wrong thing to do. Um, that's how that's that's who James Madison is, is in this story, right? So James Madison forcing forcing him to write the Bill of Rights. Um, the the reason why people wanted the Second Amendment, the South wanted it because the militia was the primary way of putting down slave revolts. Turns out, I mean, I'm not sure if everybody knows this, but turns out keeping a people in bondage against their will is hard. You have to have both numerical and military superiority. And while right. the South did have numerical superiority, that superiority did not hold in all regions of the South. So you could have little pockets in Virginia, little pockets in Georgia, little pockets in South Carolina, where slaves greatly outnumbered the white people, which was a problem for the white people. So if the slaves revolted, the only way to put down that revolt was to bring in the state militia. Well, under the initial construction of the constitution, the right to raise the state militia was thought to exist with the federal government. And the Southern states were worried because they knew that the federal government would be generally dominated by Northerners. They put in all, this, right. all these other anti-democratic kind of poison pills to keep the more populous North from dominating the country but they understood that there was at least the potential for the federal government to be dominated by Northerners. And they feared that if slaves revolted, the North would not consent to raising a militia to go put down the slave revolts. Right. So when the Second Amendment says well a well-regulated militia being necessary, and conservatives try to read that out of the, the amendment, understand that was the whole point. The well-regulated militia was the whole point of the amendment so that the South could have these militias available to crush slave revolts. That's that's and true. there's never that's any quote, mention of no any. Is that your king, right? <laughs> <laughs> there's there, and there's never any mention about that history, whatever they do, whatever they rule. It's just, you know. Scalia whited it out. Like I, I found a point in my book where, where Scalia in DC versus Heller, that's the case where Scalia just in right. whole cloth. Um, no a, mention. A, a right to firearms for self-defense, right? Um, he quotes um, a speech uh, from then Virginia Governor George Mason um, that Mason made a bet that he, that Scalia uses um, to promote this idea that self-defense was was always part of the second amendment but scalia just just bastardly cuts off the speech in his opinion right before mason gets to the part where he basically says the reason who do we need self-defense from 
the revolting slaves. Like he just takes the slaves part out and makes it seem like Mesa was just this general paranoid guy worried about crime in a rural Virginia in the 18th century. It's just, yeah. it's, it's, it's- Don't it's defund the police but it's back then. It's fully disingenuous, but this is what conservatives do when faced with a problem. When conservatives are faced with a constitutional issue where they don't like something, they just make it up. They just make up and put, they just pretend the founders thought something they didn't really think. Well, I have to not say, right. I mean, I you know, I'm I'm not a Supreme Court scholar, I'm not a lawyer, but I I I feel like I would have known that background to what Alito said and I did not. So that when you know, when I read that in your book, I was like, you know, I I should have been there. I should I should have been there. And and but we have really, you know, we have people who are not me who are lawyers and who are Supreme Court experts. And how did those people not, I mean, I, I don't want you to criticize anybody in particular unless you want to, but, it, <laughs> and so go ahead. But you know, how did that not come up? How, how was that so hidden? Well, there are two reasons for that. One, first of all, I didn't know. I, I didn't know till uh, not, nobody taught me that in law school. Okay. I, the, the, I, 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 in that, for that quote, I use a New York Times article that I didn't read until I was into my 30s. And I was like, oh, oh, wait, that's an interesting thing, right? So that's number one. Number two, though, is that, you know, law school really teaches you to, to, to stay with inside a box, right? They, they teach right. you to argue. And this is one of the, and this is another reason why I wrote the book. One of the thing, ways that the Republicans have been so successful is that e even when we're fighting, the Republicans have succeeded in making Democrats fight on Republican terms. Yes. They fight over the Republican ground. They fight over the issues Republicans want to fight about, right? Right. Uh, uh, liberals are, have been, at least when it comes to the courts, very bad about going outside the box, going outside of the Republican controlled narrative and speaking from a new narrative, from a new place of strength and from a new pr place of power. And that permeates legal discussions. So when we're talking about the Second Amendment, we start off talking about it in this originalist kind of box of like, I wonder what the founders really thought. Another way of thinking about the Second Amendment is I don't care what the founders really thought, right? Right. I don't care what people who could not conceive of a submachine gun really thought about whether I should be able to own a gun or not in a high rise apartment that they also couldn't conceive of in New York City. I just don't care. And I go from there, right? So like, that's the other problem that we have with conservatives. Look, I, I, I part, part of what I'm trying to do is, is, is to teach people the true intellectual bankruptcy of originalism and textualism, right? So like, let, let me do my, let me do my pattern, Joan. So okay. here's textualism, all right? Imagine a world where there is one law, that there's one, there's one law, that law is on a sign and that sign says no dogs allowed. That's the law. Now textualists will say, well, that's a pretty obvious sign, right? We know no right. dogs allowed. So if I show up to the store with a cat, a textualist will say, well, nope, the sign says no dogs allowed. So you can bring in your cat. And that's, again, that's a textualist reading of the law. So what if I bring in a pigeon? No dogs allowed, you're still fine. Okay, what if I bring in a turtle? This is everything, all right. What if I bring in a tiger? Well, at some point, the textualist is gonna say, oh, yeah, all right. it says no dogs allowed, but re <laughs> really, really what it means is no dangerous animals are, are, are allowed or something like that, right? So right. that's where, even in this like really simple text, we have the introduction of ambiguity. Yes, it says no dogs allowed, but does it say only dogs? Does, but does it say everything that's not a dog is allowed? No, it doesn't quite say that. So what is no dogs right. allowed? Really, it's, it's ambiguous. Even this really obvious text, it's ambiguous now. So the originalist says to solve that ambiguity, we got to go back and look at the founding fathers, right? And the originals right. will, will, will go and find a letter from Thomas Jefferson. And Jeff Jefferson will oh, well, I'm here in <laughs> India trying to look out for new countries to dominate. And these tigers seem pretty dangerous. I don't think we should allow tigers in our country, James. Oh, and the original, oh, see, no dogs allowed mean no tigers, right? That's what the originals will do. And I will say, screw that. Let's not look to the past. 
Right. Let's look to the future. Is a tiger a commonly held pet in New York City? Yes, no. Mm -hmm. If no, then you probably can't bring it into a bodega, you idiot. Right? Because <laughs> at the end of the day, here's- Bodega the cats, right? they do have them. Because here's the thing that really pisses off originalists. At the end of the day, the reason why I want to interpret the Constitution that way is because what if I want to bring a dog into the store? Textures are like, no, no dogs allowed. Originalists are like, no, no dogs allowed. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm blind. Right. I'm blind. I want to bring my uh, my. And you can. And then you can. Into the do door. And of course I must be. Of course, a reasonable accommodation for me, the blind man, should be allowed to bring his dog into a store despite the sign saying no dogs allowed. And that is my ver that is a progressive version of the Constitution, a version that understands differences, that appreciates differences, and is concerned for first and for foremost, not with the text of the law, but with the spirit of the law and with justice and fairness and equality. That's what my book is about. It, ab it absolutely is. And everybody should read it because it really does answer your questions about how the hell do we wind up here? But how the hell do we wind up fetishizing the founders when, you know, we don't necessarily fetishize, you know, people like JFK, uh, people like FDR, but we don't act like what FDR did is sacrosanct and we can't undo it. Um, how, how did that happen? So I think there's a good reason and a bad reason. The good reason is that despite what Tucker Carlson will tell you, we are a nation of immigrants. We are all from somewhere else, except for the native people whose stuff right. we stole. We are otherwise all from somebody else. We are not united by a culture. We are not united by a religion. We are not united by a race or, ethnic or ethnicity. Right. We are united by an idea. And the constitution is the idea that unites us, it is the only thing that we have in common at a very basic level, right? So it's somewhat natural to venerate or to highlight this document because it's the only thing we actually have. It's the only reason why we're all together, right? right? So that's actually a good reason to venerate the constitution. The problem is that while those ideas are great, they've never once been applied to everybody in any way. Right. Right? We have not lived a day in this country where the ideals of the Constitution are applied equally to all. Not one day just to see how it no. feels like, right? And so the other reason why people venerate it is because the Constitution, as it's written, protects the people who had power at the time it was written, which was only cis hetero white males. Right. And so so like so so we have a document that locks in their power. And everybody, and it forces everybody else to just try, remember, remember this. And I, and I think I've said this, I think to you before at, at, our, at, our, at our last event, the rest of us are just trying to get to where white men were in 1787. Right. We're just trying to catch up it's all we to want. the rights they gave <laughs> themselves in 1787, 250 years later, and we're still trying to catch up to where they are. And so that's why other people venerate the constitution because it's still because it still sets a standard of freedom and equality for white men that everybody else has to beg and scrape and claw to try to get a piece of. So, you know, we, we should definitely go to questions soon, but I, I do want to say one of the amazing things about the book is how you look at not every, but almost every amendment to the, to the Constitution and explain how the defenders of police violence have found some way to excuse it and get them out of trouble. Uh, yep. And, yeah, yep. Um, so I want you to say more about that before we go to questions. Look, I, I, in, in my book, I, can sol I have solved police brutality in my book. I mean, I can basically solve for police brutality if you let me change three cases. If you let me change three Supreme Court cases. The first one is Terry v. Ohio. That's the one that allows the cops to stop and harass me. If we change that and made it much harder for the cops to stop and harass me, we would decrease the number of times that we're even in contact 
with law enforcement, right? Second case, Graham v. Connor, that's the use of force case. That's the law, that, that's the Supreme Court case that says a cop's uh, use of force must be tied to what a reasonable cop on the scene thinks of a reasonable use of force, as opposed to an objective outside observer. That's why every time a cop shoots somebody, they say, oh, I fear for my life. Because if cops fear for his life, then according to the Supreme Court, the cop is allowed to shoot you dead. And we never get to ask, well, was it reasonable for the cop to fear for his Like, was there any objective reason to fear? Because, of course, usually there's not. But the Supreme Court doesn't adjudicate the law that way. So that's the second case we have to change. The third case we have to change is Blevins, which is the case that grants qualified immunity to police officers. Let's take that away. Right. So that if a cop violates your constitutional right, they can be sued and at least threatened with poverty because not all violations of constitutional rights will rise to the level of crime, yet cops should still be very careful when, when violating constitutional rights and they wouldn't do it so often if those violations came with cash penalties. Right. Three cases. It wouldn't solve all police brutality right away, but it would significantly decrease the scourge that we see in our streets. And I just need five justices to agree with me and I could do it. But uh, we'll you know, that I am here happen. talking to you uh, and on the Supreme Court, right? Like that's that's the thing, right? The, 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 the pe people know what to do. It's just that the people in power won't do it. Yeah. Um, we're going to go to questions soon, but I really wanted you to Last talk. Night, a Harvard person asked me if I was sad that I, if I regretted skipping Elizabeth Warren's class um, when I was in <laughs> law school. And I was like, no, because I don't want, didn't need the blood on my transcript, right? I didn't need Dragon Lady giving me a C as a 3L <laughs> when I was just trying to get out of Dodge. Are you kidding me? Her class was scary and intimidating. I am not sad that I missed it. Well, you know, I like her, so I, I hope you're not you're not insulting her. You're no, just saying she's, she's a great look. I voted for her. I think yeah. she's great, but you know, but her class she's scary. Mm. Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> that's too much. So I I did want to ask you about your dad to talk about your dad a little. Oh, that guy. That guy. So my my dad was. And this is going to be an archaic term to some in our audience. My dad was a race man. And that used to be, that used to be a thing. Like they used to call Jackie Robinson a race, race man, man. Right? We're talking about uh, men and women who sought the, the advancement of their race, who sought to bring people up with them, right? Who got to the top of the treehouse and put the ladder back down, not like Clarence Thomas. <laughs> no. Pulled it up and put it up higher. Right? But not one of those, you know, somebody who breaks the glass ceiling and then the first thing they do is call for a glass repairman. To <laughs> <laughs> um, and my, so my dad was one of those, was one of those people, one of those people who tried to, to tried to pull people up. Um, and, you know, I respected him for that. It, interpersonally, he was churlish jerk face, but like <laughs> professionally um, um, uh, had, had some good uh, parts to his, uh, to his work. Um, but one of his main jobs was to gerryman. Like my dad is, was a local legislature, legislator, first chief of staff, and then eventually a legislator. And one of his, you know, every 10 years, the, you know, you do the census and you redistrict, you redistrict at the national level. You also redistrict at the state and local level. And my dad was a municipal gerrymanderer where he and you know a couple of republicans usually would figure out where the lines would go in suffolk county and the reason why my dad was invaluable in this service is because at the time there were no black legislatures in, in suffolk county of course months, right um my dad was a black chief of staff he was the only black chief of staff my dad knew where the black people lived Right. In Suffolk, he knew where all the black people lived in Suffolk County. He knew where most of Latinos lived in Suffolk County. And so when so he was the guy that you needed in the room to draw your map because you couldn't figure out if you were drawing a majority minority district or whatever without my dad in the room. And so that's that's really what he did until finally the district for the for the woman he worked for turned uh, majority minority. 
she unfortunately passed away. And my dad ran for her seat and became the first black Suffolk County legislator in this majority, majority district that my dad drew, right? So this kind of idea of like politicians picking their voters, as opposed to, no, my dad did that for 10 years. <laughs> well, <laughs> and so I have, a, I have an understanding of gerrymandering that's a little bit different than most liberals. What I understand about gerrymandering is that while it is terrible, it is it is it right. is the most destructive force for our democracy it's also a force that can be used to highlight our democracy right it's it, it I, I in the in the book i make the analogy to fire it can cook your meal or it can burn your house down the question is whether or not it's contained and right, right now we have the tools to contain it with technology but we also can let technology run amok and totally let it burn our house down right now Republicans are able to gerrymander down to the cul-de-sac. One of the yeah. maps in North Carolina, a court once said that it was gerrymandered to decrease black participation, electoral representation with surgical precision. Surgical. That's what yeah. computers allow us to do now. Yeah. And the Supreme Court will not weigh in. Just uh, John Roberts has literally said that he doesn't care that he finds gerrymandering an undu a, a non-justiciable, that means that he can't rule on it, political question, and has just unleashed unlimited gerrymandering uh, throughout the country. And it's one of the main things that we're fighting uh, now when it comes to voter suppression. We see these Republican gerrymanderers um, all throughout the country right. basically taking away the Black vote. Definitely. So do we have someone out there who's going to get us questions for from the audience? Yes, hello. I will be uh, monitoring this and, and moderating this. So our first question comes from Janet Blaustein. If we update everything from detergent to cars, what makes our constitution so untouchable? <laughs> right, right, like why? Why does everything else get, get, get an update, not our constitution, right? Look, the, the, the problem again, from where I said, it's not just updating, it's not just the amendments, because, if, because in the book, I try to really make it clear that even an amendment is powerless against a conservative Supreme Court. 15th Amendment was ratified after the Civil War. It says clearly that the right to vote cannot be denied on account of race and conservatives took that amendment and put it in a drawer and pretended like it didn't exist for a hundred years. Right. We fought a war to get that amendment and conservatives in the South pretended like it didn't exist for a hundred years. And by the way, conservatives in the North didn't love it, right? <laughs> they didn't embrace it exactly. Um, so, and that's the 15th amendment. We finally uh, had another social uprising to make the 15th Amendment real, culminating in the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, what my pick is for the single most important piece of legislation in American history, because you cannot have a democracy without some commitment to universal suffrage. And that did not happen until the Voting Rights Act granted suffrage truly to Black people and Black women, because the 19th Amendment didn't do a lot for Black women. So we finally get this uh, Voting Rights Act. It works so famously that in 40 years, Black people go from an oppressed people in the South to having the political clout to help elect the first Black president. That's 40 years. That's a boom. Look at what we can do when you take your foot off our neck. And white people are like, wow, look at what they can do when you take them. Put that, where's the foot? <laughs> the foot back. And before the first Black president was even out of office, John Roberts and conservatives on the Supreme Court, what did they do? They took away the 15th Amendment by eviscerating the Voting Rights Act in 2013. And now we're back here. So even an amendment, as important as those are, even an update or a change to the Constitution, they mean nothing in the face of dedicated conservative justices who refuse to apply those amendments and those principles to everybody. Um, let's see. From Francis Lagnum, do you expect hey, surprises? Francis, hi. <laughs> do you expect surprises from the court in the next four-ish years? Gorsuch siding against the CIA was a surprise to me. Gorsuch and the CIA, CIA case was a surprise. Gorsuch and Bostock was a surprise. Um, my, I don't expect surprises because of they have Amy Coney Barrett now. Um, I always look amongst liberal legal circles. There are, there's a wide debate amount amongst who's most gettable, 
you know, a lot of people will say Roberts. I think Roberts is the right answer, except for voting rights. Roberts has been an enemy of voting rights his entire career. He's not going to change now. Um, people are wondering if alleged attempt at rapist Brett Kavanaugh is gettable on certain issues. I look, Kavanaugh has a, is a weak has a weak moral character. Like, I mean, just straight up, he's a weak right. man, and he tends to go with who the strongest person in, in the room is. So Kavanaugh is gettable in the sense that if the other strong people in his orbit are pulling him one way, he will fold because he's a weak human. Um, but a lot of in a lot of situations, I think Gorsuch is the most gettable, not because he's in any way reasonable. Gorsuch is a straight up nihilist. Um, he has his ideology and he does not care about the consequences of that ideology. But the man has a code. And because he has an ideology, he's also willing to kind of go against more so than any of the other ones, kind of willing against to, to go against his preferred outcome in certain situations because of his ideology. So for instance, Gorsuch has a soft spot when it comes to uh, Native American rights. He really, he, mm -hmm. he, he is a good justice when it comes to Native American rights, probably will go down as one of the strongest justices um, for Native American rights. So I think we can see more decisions like that. When it comes to, you know, black people voting or women having access to their bodies, no, Gorsuch is not gettable on those, on those issues. So those are the kinds of surprises that you can see around the margin. But Francis, make no mistake, if you let conservatives control the court six to three for the next generation, the only thing that will happen is pain. Mm -hmm. Conservatives are on the cusp of getting everything they want. They're not going to blink now, all right? They're not, they, 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 they've been groomed. Neil Gorsuch was made in a test tube. Amy Coney Barrett was made in a test tube. They were groomed to take away a woman's right to choose. Now that they finally have the opportunity to do so, they ain't gonna blink. And so we're in for a very dark period um, in terms of rights, uh, um, unless we do something um, to wrest control of the court back from the conservatives. Um. Um, from Timothy Lyons, as an attorney, can I refuse service to represent? Oh, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> As an attorney, can I refuse service to represent a conservative Christian who wants me to represent them? How is that different from refusing to bake the cake for us gays? Hmm, good question. So can you refuse uh, uh, services, right? Well, as an attorney, of course you can re refuse services because you have to, that's literally a speech act, right? Like arguing in front of a court. I can't think of a more speechifying speech thing <laughs> than that, right? Again, my argument is that baking a cake is not a speech act. My argument is that making a Subway sandwich is not a speech act. My argument from an earlier time would be that um, uh, uh, serving a black person dinner at a table as opposed to from behind the, the kitchen in the back of the alley, that is not a speech act. Um, opening a hotel room to a black customer, that is not a speech act, right? So we can make distinctions between things that are not speech acts, which I would count baking a cake, versus things that are speech acts, which I would say are, you know, arguing in front of court or or making a painting or sculpting, you know? I think that there's a, you know, I would make a distinction. And I don't know if this is like, a, 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 I, don't, I haven't fully kind of looked at all the precedents here, but in my gut, I would make a distinction between a baker and a wedding singer, right? If you want mm -hmm. Adam Sandler to come sing at your wedding, <laughs> And Adam Sandler doesn't want to sing at your wedding. I don't think that you have a right to. And he says he straight up says like, "No, Ellie, I don't want to sing at your wedding because you're black." I'd be like, "Wow, Adam Sandler, that hurts my feelings." <laughs> but okay, I guess I guess I'll just never see your crappy movies again. Like whatever. But like, I would probably defend Adam Sandler's right to not come, even if he was employed as a wedding singer, to not have to come sing my wedding, sing at my wedding, even if he explicitly said the reason why he wasn't going to perform at my wedding was because he disagreed with my race, because performance is kind of necessarily a speech act. Baking a cake? No. <laughs> so that's my No answer. matter how beautiful it is. Right, no matter how much artistry is in it, right? It's masterpiece. It's a masterpiece. <laughs> like, come on. No, and remember, nobody even asked. He didn't have to make a special. He just had to make one of his standard wedding. Just um, the basics. Right, I just, no. And again, this is a moot point because he didn't even argue it. 
<laughs> even hard. Yeah, you know, I, I, but I do say, uh, I do say, Tim, in the book, look at the the other way that we know that Jack Phillips, this is the name of the baker, um, w- was full of crap. Is look at the next case that he got himself into, right? Because after masterpiece, after the gay rights case, he then refused service to a transgender uh, a right. woman who wanted a cake for her birthday and uh, transition celebration. And he said, "Well, I don't, I don't agree with with transgender. I think uh, gender is defined by God at birth. So I'm not going to bake you a cake." Where's your speech ob- objection? Where's your speech right to say I'll bake a cake for a woman, but not that woman? Right. What's up with that, right? So, like again, I, I, I think that when you talk about something that is service based, you're not talking about speech acts. But when you talk about something that's more performative, sure. Yeah. Um, this next one's a little bit of a long one, but um, Thomas Santoro, Santoriello says, love you both. My question is about the First Amendment. In my opinion, years of coordinated Republican misinformation was has been an abuse against the spirit of the First Amendment. However, now that we have real-time communication on a global scale, the First Amendment seems more like a weapon for the right, right wing to create an alternative reality and less a protection on American speech. Do you or Joan have any thoughts on this? I mean, Joan, you can answer that as well, because I think that as journalists, we're probably going to agree most closely in terms of like, leave the press alone, because when Jeff Sessions is in charge, it all goes back. (laughs) Right. Right. And I mean, you went through the whole, you know, Gawker nightmare. Um, And there are these people who are finding new chinks in the armor of uh the first amendment and seriously you know they're they're not they're not big i don't know that you could take down the new york times right but they they have taken down smaller outfits and that is horrible uh and so we have to you know we have to look at that and (laughs) ellie i thought it was so funny that you were like i have to think about if i you know, defame one of those awful oligarchs. Let's just call them oligarchs because that's what they are. Let's just start getting that term going. Um, but, you know, we can we can talk about ideas, but if we happen to name an oligarch, not necessarily a Russian one, but, you know, one of the many American ones, we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen because they have figured out how they can bring organizations down and it is really terrifying and so from that perspective i'm I, i'm not willing to change the laws to make it easier to sue fox for defamation because they right. lie all the time because while i agree fox is bad and dangerous and lies all the time those exact same laws that you would use to sue fox for defamation right. because they lie all the time will be used by you know kyle rittenhouse to sue Whoopi goldberg which is gonna happen folks Right, like, and Whoopi Goldberg is, you know, is, is what she can defend herself. But like, you know, eventually, and the view can defend her and all right. all that. Right, but like, these people are going to find people that are not in a good position to defend themselves, and they're going to take it, take them down. And that's what happened to Gawker. So, you know, I'm I'm very skeptical about the the way to the way to deal with Fox is not through uh, uh, restricting speech. It's by getting white people to be less racist like i know that sounds like well how are you gonna do that but like that's that's been the whole that's been the whole game like to, to quote chris chris rock like what black this is racism is a white people problem right and so we're just like for the most part we're just waiting for white people to get better at this thing than they have been you know joan joan's last book right what's what's the problem with white people like that's that's where you deal with fox not through the first amendment but like you you get better white people in this country and 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 that's 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 a longer term project but certainly more a, a safer um goal than trying to just completely change the the parameters around free speech Right. Um, from Stacy Sheffield, speaking of voting rights, do you see the For the People Act and or the John Lewis Voting Rights Act passing in 2022, if at all? Hmm. Uh, Stacy, the real question is, if they pass, what will it matter? 
John Roberts destroyed the Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act in 2013 in Shelby County v. Holder. John Lewis Voting Rights Act seeks to restore uh, that section. Did John Roberts go somewhere that I'm not aware of? No, he's still oh, there. He's still I think there. he's still there. And his position is stronger than it was in 2013 because he's got more conservative justices with him than he did in 2013. If they pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act or the Freedom to Vote Act, the 6-3 conservative court will just immediately strike it down. They will strike it down before breakfast. Yeah. We've already been in a situation where uh, 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 Brett Kavanaugh said that you couldn't strike down racist gerrymandering in Alabama before the midterm election because we were too close to the midterm election. He said that in February. So if they pass the, the not the that John, close, really, you know. But so you see, we we passed the John Lewis Voting Rights Act in June, which we're not gonna. But if we did, right. the court would go oh, it's entirely too close to the election for it to have any force and effect now. And then by the time they got around to twenty twenty three, they would just they would just overturn it outright. Again, one of the key points of my book is that you can't. There is nothing that we can win if we don't expand and reform the Supreme Court. There's just you know, name me an issue that you care about, whether it's voting rights climate change, gun rights, I can tell you how the Supreme Court will just take that away if you yeah. let conservatives control it. Uh, and speaking of um, the Supreme Court expansion, we have a question from Clara Tondro. Are there people in positions of influence who agree with expanding the Supreme Court? What are our odds and what can we citizens do to push the effort along? Mondo Jones agrees with it. Uh, one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, I think Schumer was, was expansion curious, uh, before the elections, you know, before, when he thought he was going to have a bigger majority, basically in the Senate, right. he was curious about it. Um, not so much anymore. Uh, no, look, but, but here's, here's the real answer. The reason why Democrats lose on the courts is because Republican voters care. And for the most part, Democratic voters don't. You cannot win a primary in the Republican Party for Senate or president while being weak on the courts. I take you back to 2016. Donald Trump, outsider candidate, crazy man, talking about Mexicans are bad and uh, sexually assaulting people and all these crazy. But when it came to the courts, oh, he straightened up real quick. Got he right in line. That list that was right down center mass came from the federal society he didn't mess around with the courts at all because republicans wouldn't have stood for it they would have accepted everything else but they wouldn't have, have accepted him having a crazy wackadoodle idea of who he was going to support to, on the supreme court now fast forward to 2020 joe biden is the most conservative candidate um in the democratic primary when it comes to court reform and court expansion pete Buttigieg had a whole plan bernie sanders and elizabeth warren were both curious Cory Booker said that he was interested in studying that. Joe Biden was like, nope, maybe a commission, but right? Joe Biden was the most conservative on court reform. Didn't cost him a vote. It never caught, there is not a Democrat that has lost a primary on the issue of the courts no. since I've been alive. So that's why we lose. People in power do not, Democrats in power do not take court expansion and court reform seriously because no Democrat is running at them from the left and beating them in primaries on the issue of court reform. And until that happens, they will continue to not really care about expanding the courts or taking back the courts. Whereas Republicans, if you do not tell Republican voters, I can go to a tabernacle in Utah and I can find some lady who like, thinks Trump is kind of racist, maybe, and certainly misogynist, and doesn't like what he does with those prostitutes. <laughs> but she's going to vote Republican. She's going to vote for Trump, and she's going to vote for all the Republicans because she cares about abortion. Right? I can go find that person. You know that person exists. You've, you've been to Thanksgiving dinner with that person. You know who that person is, right? No, I have not. I mean, so you, the, the royal right. you. Somebody. <laughs> Somebody has. Okay, can I just disagree with you? Not totally. But I am very impressed that Biden has put all of these, you know, lower court justices in place, with, 
when I don't know why Barack Obama didn't figure out that that was something he had to do. Biden so that's just the with, only with the appointments thing that McConnell left for him. Yes, the, the very few. Yeah, because McConnell just Biden went to town. Biden has been great at filling those appointments with diverse candidates, not just diverse in terms of racial, gender um, diversity, but diverse in terms of prof professional experience. Yes, um, young people. Uh, uh, he's been he's been great. He's been he's way better that than Obama. He's been absolutely great on the judges that he's he's picked to fill. He's been great with it with his picks for his cabinet. He's yeah, got the most diverse Agreed. cabinet. Um, in, in American history, when it and also to, ideologically diverse, like when, when you know, it comes some to real representation. Biden has been stellar when it comes to policy. I know, I know. that's where we fall down with Joe Biden, right? And that's where, and that's where Democrats traditionally fall down, right? Like we Democrats generally do perform the right game, right? I mean, they got the right, they got the Kenta cloth, and they're kneeling at the time, and they're saying <laughs> Black Lives Matters, and they. Right? I do remember the Kenta cloth. Actual policy changes. That's where Democrats lose their nerve, right? And that's what, and I think what the courts. That's what we're saying with Biden as well. Look, I don't want to be overly negative about Joe Biden. And again, I think he's been very, the kinds of people he's appointed. Absolutely, one hundred percent, great job, right. best slate of candidates that I've ever seen, bar none. We need we need ten people look just like her. Yeah. Well, that is, I think, going to wrap it up for this evening. Ellie, do you have any, any last thought to send us out into the night and the future with? Sure. Um, please buy the book. Because <laughs> last thought. I agree. Please, God. Um, because I want people to care. I, I've, I, uh, I wrote the book in as plain English as I could. Um, trying to not dumb down the law because I don't think the law needs to be dumbed down, but trying to explain the law in ways that everybody can understand it. Because I honestly believe that if everybody could understand the law and understand what conservatives are doing to the law, everybody would be just as passionate about it as I am and be just as committed to it, to changing it. People understand how Congress works or doesn't work. People understand how the presidency works or doesn't work. People need to understand how the courts work or don't work so that we have the tools to change it. That's why I want people to buy the book. Well, that's also, wonderful. And thank you both of you so much for joining us. I've put the purchase link into the chat for Allow Me to Retort. Um, thank you, Joan and Ellie for joining us tonight. And thank you all of you out there for spending our e your evening with us. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, keep reading and have a great evening. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.